Michael's visit today was my only glimmer of hope in months. The house seemed colder with every passing photograph. The smiling faces of my grandchildren now seemed like a cruel joke. They hadn't visited for months, which made my pain unbearable. I was desperate for answers, and now Miguel promised to give them to me. What he ended up revealing forced me to remove my grandchildren from my will. I woke early, the silence of the house accentuating my loneliness. The morning light struggled to fill the empty spaces, reminding me of the absence of laughter and chaos that my grandchildren used to bring. Each day now seemed like an eternity, and I found myself longing for the noise, the hugs, and even the occasional arguments. Today, I was hoping Miguel would help me understand why all of that disappeared. I headed into the living room, passing by the photographs of my grandchildren, who seemed to mock me with their vivacity. Framed photographs of birthdays, holidays, and ordinary days out, each one captured a time when we were all together. Now they served only as painful reminders of what I had lost. I couldn't help but wonder what had changed. What had I done to drive them away? With a cup of tea in hand, I sat in my favorite spot, trying to shake off the weight of my heart. The steam rose, but it did little to warm the cold of the empty house. I stared out the window, hoping to see Miguel's car approaching. The questions buzzed in my head, and I couldn't silence them. Today I had to bring answers. I was desperate to understand. It had been months since I had last seen their faces, and the pain was becoming unbearable. I missed their laughter, their little hands and mine, the stories they shared with enthusiasm. Each day without them was like a grain of sand passing through an hourglass. The void left by their absence was growing, and the emptiness was too great to bear. I needed to know what had happened. My son, Michael, had promised to visit me today. Perhaps he could shed some light on why my grandchildren were avoiding me. Michael was always the sensible one, the one I could count on to be honest. I clung to the hope that he knew something, anything, that might explain the sudden silence. Your visit was the only beacon in the ocean of uncertainty I was drowning in. Michael arrived around noon, his face carrying a burden I couldn't decipher. He came in and I offered him a cup of tea, hoping the warmth would ease the tension I felt. As we sat across the table, I watched him closely. His eyes told a story, one I was eager to hear. But first, I prepared myself for what was to come. We exchanged greetings, but I could feel a tension in the air. Miguel talked about his work, the weather, and other worldly matters, but his voice lacked conviction. I was clearly avoiding the elephant in the room. I waited patiently, trying to read between the lines. The small talk seemed like a prelude to something much bigger, something deeper. I needed him to get straight to the point. I asked him directly why the children didn't come to visit me. Michael, why didn't they come? What did I do? My voice cracked with the weight of my emotions. His gaze shifted from mine, and he took a deep breath. The room grew even colder as I waited for his answer. Miguel's silence spoke volumes, but I needed words. I needed the truth. He hesitated, looking away, and I could see the conflict in his eyes. Mom, he began, his voice barely above a whisper. There's something you need to know, but I'm not sure how to tell you. My heart was pounding in my chest as I leaned toward him, silently urging him to continue. This was the moment of truth that I had both feared and longed for. It's complicated, Mom, he said finally, running a hand through his hair. His eyes darted around the room, avoiding mine. I could see the tension in his posture, the way his shoulders were hunched as if he were carrying the weight of the world. His statement only fueled my anxiety, leaving me more desperate than ever for a clear answer. Complicated wasn't enough to describe what I was feeling. I pressed him for details, leaning forward in my chair. Michael, I need to know what's going on. Please tell me the truth. I begged. He shook his head slightly and sighed. Mom, I promise I'll explain everything soon. Now is not the best time, he said, his voice tinged with frustration. I watched him, feeling simultaneously furious and worried as he dodged my questions. Days turned into weeks and Miguel's words haunted me. 
Each day felt like a blur as I replayed our conversation over and over in my mind. What could be so complicated that he couldn't share it with me? I found myself staring at the phone, willing it to ring, but he remained silent, just like the empty rooms in my house. I felt a growing emptiness that no question could fill. I busied myself with gardening, hoping the activity would distract me from my worries. My hands worked the soil, planting rows of roses and tulips, the scent offering a brief respite from the stress building inside me. The pace of work brought me some peace, but it was fleeting. Each flower reminded me of the grandchildren who used to run around the yard, helping me plant flowers. One afternoon, I ran into Mrs. Jenkins, my neighbor, who mentioned to me in passing that she had seen my grandchildren in the park the previous weekend. They looked so happy playing, she said with a smile, not realizing the stab she had stabbed me in the heart. I forced a smile and nodded, feeling my insides twist in agony. They were out there, so close, yet so impossibly far away from me. My heart sank. They were so close yet seemed so far away. The realization that they had been nearby without visiting was unbearable. I could almost hear their laughter in the wind, see their faces in the shadows of the trees. The loneliness became even more acute, knowing they were within my reach but out of touch. The need for answers became stronger, leading me to take matters into my own hands. I decided to dig deeper for myself. If Michael didn't give me the answers I needed, I would find them myself. With that decision, I sat down at my desk, grabbed my cell phone and a notepad. I would make phone calls, ask questions, and refuse to be dismissed. I had to know why my grandchildren had seemingly disappeared from my life. My determination grew stronger with every passing minute. I called my daughter-in-law, Linda, hoping she could enlighten me. Hello, Linda, it's me. I began. Her voice was hurried on the other end. I'm very busy right now, she said hurriedly. Linda, please, I just need to know why the kids haven't visited me. I insisted. She sighed audibly then said, I really can't talk right now, before quickly hanging up. His evasion only increased my worries. Determined to get answers, I hired a private detective to investigate the situation. It wasn't a decision I made lightly, but my desperation drove me there. I met him in a discreet cafe in the city center and explained my situation. He assured me that he would be thorough and confidential. When I handed him a photograph of my grandchildren, hope flickered inside me. Maybe, just maybe, he could find out the truth. I felt guilty for going behind my son's back, but my desperation overrode my conscience. As I waited for the investigator's conclusions, I struggled with my decision. Was I betraying Michael's trust? Guilt tormented me, but so did the need to understand. Every time I saw the pictures of my grandchildren, I knew I had no choice. I had to know why they were kept away from me. Mr. Davis, the investigator, met me at the cafe and assured me that he would handle the matter discreetly. He spoke confidently explaining that he had years of experience in these types of cases. Don't worry, he said, putting the photograph of my grandchildren in his pocket. I will take care of the matter for you. His words gave me a glimmer of hope, but the waiting game began, leaving me anxious for his conclusions. While I awaited Mr. Davis's conclusions, I tried to pursue my hobbies. Gardening, baking, and reading filled my days but my mind kept returning to the mystery of my grandchildren's absence. I found solace, albeit briefly, in these activities, but nothing could completely distract me from the questions that tormented me. The clock seemed to tick slower, each minute stretching into an eternity as I waited for answers. Painting helped me deal with my anxiety. Each brushstroke was a small distraction, but it always led my thoughts back to the family I felt I was losing. The images I painted often ended up looking like my grandchildren, with their faces materializing almost unconsciously on the canvas. It was bittersweet. Art gave me a temporary escape, but each finished piece reminded me of the emptiness in my life. Mr. Davis's first report came in, but it was inconclusive. He mentioned seeing the children with their mother in several places at school, at the park, and at the grocery store, but nothing seemed unusual. They look well cared for, he observed. 
trying to reassure me. However, his observations only increased my frustration. I needed more than just appearances. I needed to know why they were hidden from me. Frustrated with the lack of progress, I decided to visit Michael's house unannounced. It was a bold move, but I couldn't wait any longer. My heart raced as I reached the front door. I hoped this would finally give me the answers I was looking for. I took a deep breath, steadied myself, and headed toward the house, ready to face whatever came next. As I approached, I noticed my grandchildren playing in the yard my heart, filled with joy at the sight of them, their laughter filling the air. But as soon as they saw me, a look of surprise crossed their faces, and they immediately ran inside. The abruptness of their reaction surprised me and added a layer of confusion. Didn't they want to see me? What was going on? Linda came out a moment later, her face a mask of coldness. She stood on the porch, arms crossed, making no move to invite me in. What are you doing here? he asked bluntly. His tone was icy, as if my presence was a great inconvenience. My heart sank at his hostility, but I tried to keep my voice steady. I came to see my grandchildren, I replied. Linda didn't move standing there with a defensive posture that only increased my suspicions even more. They're busy right now. Maybe another time, she said brusquely. I could see the tension in her posture, but I chose not to press her. I walked away, but inside my determination only grew. Something was definitely wrong, and Linda's reaction confirmed that I needed to dig deeper. I decided to sit down with Miguel again, and we arranged to have dinner in a quiet restaurant. The atmosphere was serene, a stark contrast to the whirlwind of emotions that was going on inside me. As we ate, I watched him closely, hoping to find some opening to talk about what was happening. I didn't want to ruin dinner, but I knew I had to talk about it before the night was over. At dinner, I couldn't take it anymore. Michael, I went to your house to see the kids, I said, my voice firm but firm. He looked up, surprised. And, he asked, though I sense he already knew where this was going. They came running in as soon as they saw me. Linda was less than welcoming. I watched her reaction closely, hoping it might shed some light on the situation. He sighed deeply and looked into my eyes, his eyes full of agitation. It was clear that whatever was going through his head was disturbing him deeply. His lips parted as if he were about to speak, but he hesitated, weighing his words carefully. Mother, this is not easy to say. He began, his voice low and tense. I held my breath, waiting for the revelation that seemed so close, yet so elusive. It's more complicated than you think, Mom, he repeated, the words hanging in the air between us. I searched his face for clues, trying to decipher the enigma he was presenting. What do you mean, Michael? I asked him, my voice barely above a whisper. He ran a hand through his hair, visibly struggling. Just please trust me. It's not what it seems, he said, avoiding my desperate gaze. His enigmatic answer left me confused and worried. I felt a knot in my stomach, my anxiety growing with every second of silence. Michael, I need more than that. I begged, my voice shaking. But he just shook his head, his lips pressed into a thin line. The sense of foreboding grew stronger within me clouding my thoughts and making me feel more lost than before. He promised to reveal everything soon and begged me to give him a little more time. I know it's hard, but please believe me, Mom. I'll explain everything, but not today, he said, his eyes pleading for my patience. How much longer, Miguel? I asked, feeling the weight of uncertainty crushing me. Just a little longer, he replied. I nodded reluctantly hoping that his promise would soon turn into the answers I desired. When I returned home, I found a letter in my mailbox, and signed but which directly addressed my concerns. I opened it, my heart pounding as my eyes scanned the neatly typed words. The letter spoke of things that only someone close to me could know. Be patient, it advised, hinting at hidden truths in our family. My mind raced trying to figure out who could have sent it and what it meant for the enigma surrounding my grandchildren. The letter hinted at family secrets and advised me to be patient. The truth will come out, 
It assured in an enigmatic tone. Frustration bubbled inside me as I crumpled the paper in my hands. Who would know these secrets and why couldn't they tell me directly? My heart was pounding with a mixture of anticipation and fear. The answers were tantalizingly close, but still just out of my reach. I desperately needed clarity. Perplexed and increasingly anxious, I decided to confront Linda directly. I could not wait any longer in the dark. Grabbing my keys, I decided to get the truth out of him, no matter what the cost. His evasiveness had only added fuel to the fire of my suspicions. If Michael wouldn't or couldn't tell me, then maybe Linda could. I was ready to face her and demand the answers I so desperately needed. I showed up at her workplace, hoping to catch her off guard. When I walked through the office door, I saw her behind her desk, chatting with a colleague. She looked up, and for a split second, surprise crossed her face. I need to talk to you, Linda, I said, keeping my voice steady. She looked at her watch, sighed, and then nodded reluctantly. Okay, on my lunch break, he replied. She looked startled to see me, but agreed to talk during her lunch break. We found a quiet spot in a nearby park. What's this about? She asked, her tone reserved. I didn't hold back. Why have the kids been avoiding me? I asked. Linda shifted uncomfortably, her eyes darting around as if searching for an escape. It's complicated, she said, echoing Miguel's words irritably. There are issues that need to be resolved, she added vaguely. Her cautious responses only increased my uneasiness as she vaguely mentioned problems that needed to be addressed. What problems? I insisted, but she remained evasive. It's not something I can discuss right now, she replied, without meeting my eyes. Frustration burned inside me as I realized I was no closer to the truth. I left the conversation with more questions than I had before, feeling despair eating away at my core. Mr. Davis's final report arrived, and it was not what I expected. It noted financial problems and a possible rift between Michael and Linda. He even found evidence of secret behavior and tension in their home. My mind was racing as I read the document, absorbing every sentence. The report offered clues but no clear solutions. It felt like a puzzle, with the pieces just out of reach. Shocked, I sat there rereading the report. My son had never told me anything like this. Financial problems? A strained relationship? I wondered why Miguel hadn't said anything. Did he not trust me enough? I felt a mixture of confusion and betrayal. This was information I should have known, especially if it was affecting my grandchildren. I needed to take action and do something to help. Determined to get to the bottom of the matter, I decided to have a frank conversation with Miguel. Avoiding the subject was no longer an option. I picked up the phone and called to invite him to come over. Miguel. Can you come over tonight? We need to talk, I insisted. He paused and nodded. He hoped that an honest, open conversation would finally bring the clarity he craved. I set the dining table for two, with the goal of having a calm and relaxed evening. The fact that Michael came home to a calm environment might encourage him to open up about the situation. I carefully chose our favorite dishes, hoping that the family atmosphere would encourage him to speak honestly. As I cleared the dishes and poured the drinks, my heart raced. This seemed like the moment when everything could finally come to a head. As the drinks were being served, I felt a palpable tension in the air. Michael arrived and we took our seats. I could tell he was fidgeting, looking around the room as if searching for an escape. My hands were steady, but my heart was pounding. Here's to us, I said, raising my glass in an attempt to lighten the mood. At that moment, I knew discovery was at hand. Over a glass of wine, Miguel began to speak, his voice shaking. Mom, there's something I need to tell you. He began, looking into the glass. I held my breath and leaned in, listening intently. We've been having a hard time, he admitted, struggling for words. This was the opening I had been waiting for. He was finally willing to share. I encouraged him to continue. Hanging on his every word. We're under a lot of financial pressure, he confessed, his eyes avoiding mine. 
It's caused a lot of arguments between Linda and me, and it's affecting the kids. I could see the exhaustion on his face, the weight of his worries pressing down on him. He described in detail the mounting debt, the unexpected expenses, and the financial hardships that were silently crushing the family. Each word touched my heart, increasing my concern. Miguel continued, his voice thick with shame. I didn't want you to know, Mom. I thought it was a burden I had to carry. Finally, he looked up, his eyes filled with guilt. I've been trying to protect you from our problems. His confession made it clear why he had remained silent. He believed he had to handle everything himself, sparing me the stress. But its isolation only amplified the problem. An overwhelming mix of emotions washed over me. Relief that the truth had been revealed, anger that I had been kept in the dark, and sadness for the difficulties my son was facing. You should have told me sooner. I managed to say, my voice choked with emotion. Miguel looked down, nodding. I know, Mom. I just... His voice trailed off, and I saw the weight of his burden. We sat there, unsure of what our next steps would be. Miguel then admitted that Linda was particularly concerned about my potential intrusion. Mom thinks that if you know, you'll try to intervene and solve everything, and that will only increase the tension, he explained. I felt a pang of sadness. I had never meant to intrude, but I couldn't deny my instinct to help. Understanding Linda's concerns added another layer to the puzzle. It was clear that communication failures were part of the problem. I assured him of my unconditional love and willingness to help. Michael, we are family. No matter what happens, I'll always be by your side. I said, squeezing his hand. We'll get through this together. His eyes softened, reflecting a gleam of relief. Thank you, Mom. I really needed to hear that, he admitted. I could feel a small crack in the wall that had been erected between us, and for the first time in months, hope filled me. With my mood a little clearer, I decided to organize a family meeting to discuss financial help and find a way to bring my grandchildren back into my life. We need to have a family dinner so that everything is out in the open, I suggested. Miguel nodded, albeit hesitantly. That might be a good idea, he agreed. I took that as a positive sign. Bridging the gaps in our communication was the first step toward repairing our strained relationship. Linda, suspicious but cooperative, agreed to have dinner at my house. It's for the best for the kids, she said in a measured tone. I felt a sense of progress. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate your understanding, I replied. We set a date and time, hoping that this dinner would pave the way for healing. The prospect of having my family under the same roof again filled me with hope and anxiety, but it seemed like a step in the right direction. The evening was tense but productive. We discussed practical solutions to their problems. Around the dinner table, everyone shared ideas. How about a budget plan? Miguel suggested. Linda hesitantly agreed. We can cut back on some expenses. We made a list of financial priorities, mapping out a path forward. The children played quietly nearby, a silent reminder of why we needed to address this situation. By the end of the night, our collective determination seemed to be the glue that held us together. My grandchildren, still suspicious, watched but kept their distance. They stood at the edge of the living room, looking at us but not getting involved. My heart yearned to fill that gap. I made an effort to include them in the conversations. How's school going? I asked, but they responded with short, polite answers. The distance was not just physical, it was also emotional. I hoped this dinner would be just the beginning, a small crack that would allow light back into our lives. I hoped this would be the first step toward repairing our fractured family. Dinner had gone better than I expected, giving me a glimmer of hope. As they prepared to leave, I hugged each of them, including the grandchildren, who seemed a little more receptive. We'll figure this out, I whispered to Miguel and Linda. They nodded, looking tired but hopeful. A small flame of optimism ignited inside me. This was a difficult path, but at least we had started. As the night was coming to an end, Miguel took me aside and revealed the last piece of the puzzle. Mom, can we talk in private, he asked. 
I followed him into the living room, feeling a sense of foreboding. There's one more thing you should know, he began, his voice low. My heart raced, and I urged him on. He took a deep breath, finally ready to reveal the truth that had been lurking in the shadows of our fractured family. The real reason my grandchildren were avoiding me was due to a misunderstanding fueled by Linda's insecurities. Miguel hesitated and then explained, Linda thought you were criticizing her education. Some comments you made, she misinterpreted them. My mind raced, trying to remember anything I could have said to make her feel this way. So she's been keeping the kids away because of this? I asked, astonished. Miguel nodded, his face showing regret. It all started to make sense. She had believed that I was critical and judgmental of her education, based on superficial comments I had made in the past. I never meant to judge her. I murmured, my heart heavy. Miguel nodded, understanding. I tried to tell her, but she's too sensitive. He thought it best to keep the kids away to avoid further conflict. I sighed, feeling the weight of his unintentional words. We have to talk about this. I stated firmly. It's the only way forward the children were caught in the middle, not knowing the real reasons behind their separation. They have been so confused. Miguel admitted his voice thick with emotion. They miss you, but they don't understand why they can't see you. My heart ached to hear this. We have to work this out for their sake. I said, we both agreed to approach Linda carefully with the goal of having an open and honest conversation to heal the division in our family and bring the grandchildren back into our lives. My heart broke as I realized that my words had caused the separation. As I sat there, I felt the gravity of my past comments weighing on my conscience. It wasn't my intention to belittle Linda's education, but my thoughtless words had been interpreted that way by her. Hearing Miguel explain his reasons made me understand the depth of the misunderstanding. It was painful to think that my own words had alienated my grandchildren. The truth was out, and I knew I had to make amends. This wasn't something I could ignore or wait for it to go away on its own. Linda's fears and my grandchildren's confusion were clear signs that immediate action was needed. I couldn't let my family continue to suffer from unresolved issues. Instead of dwelling on the past, I decided to take steps to improve my relationship with Linda and, eventually, with my grandchildren. I decided to apologize to Linda for any unintentional hurt my comments had caused. I picked up the phone and called her, my hands shaking slightly. Linda, can we talk? I asked, my voice softer than usual. She agreed, albeit hesitantly, and we decided to meet the next day. I spent the evening thinking about my words, focusing on being sincere and making sure she felt heard and understood. This apology had to come from the heart. She looked surprised, but she listened to me attentively. As she spoke, I noticed the tightness in her expression slowly ease. Linda, I'm so sorry if my words hurt you. It was never my intention to make you feel judged. I said sincerely, my eyes meeting hers. Her initial surprise turned into a contemplative look. She didn't interrupt, allowing me to fully express my regret. It seemed like the first step in bridging the emotional gap between us. I promise to be more understanding and supportive in the future. I want to support you and the kids in whatever you need. I said, my voice firm but full of emotion. We will get through this together for the sake of our family. Linda seemed touched by my words. A small but significant change in her demeanor indicated that she had realized my sincerity. His reserved posture softened slightly, giving me a glimmer of hope. Linda softened, and for the first time in months, I felt hope. Her defensive posture relaxed, and she nodded, a hesitant smile on her lips. I appreciate you saying that, she replied calmly. The tension that had clouded our interaction seemed to dissipate, replaced by a tenuous but growing trust. At that moment, I knew that rebuilding our relationship would not be easy, but this conversation was a crucial first step in healing the family fracture. We agreed to work together for the good of the family. Let's take small steps one day at a time, Linda suggested, her voice more open than I had heard in a long time. I nodded in agreement, feeling a sense of relief. 
This mutual understanding gave me courage. Let's communicate better and be more honest with each other. I promised. Linda's eyes met mine, and I saw a flicker of agreement. Our journey to restoration had begun. I reached out to my grandchildren, explaining the misunderstanding in age-appropriate terms. Sitting them down, I said gently, Sometimes adults make mistakes and misunderstand each other. That's what happened between your mother and me. His curious eyes looked at me, and I saw a glimmer of understanding. We're working on it. I hope we can spend more time together again, I added. Their hesitant smiles gave me hope that they were willing to rekindle the relationship. They slowly began to approach me. Our first meetings were brief but meaningful. Little by little, the children approached me with stories about school and friends, lessening their initial hesitation. Each small interaction felt like a precious victory. Tell me more about your favorite games. I encouraged, eager to rebuild our connection. Their laughter, once a distant memory, began to return, filling my heart with cautious optimism. Eventually, our family began to heal, and I revised my will to include them again. It felt like a symbolic, open-hearted, hopeful gesture. The process of getting back together had taught me the importance of communication and empathy. Sitting down for the last time, I signed the documents with renewed faith in our future. This journey had been arduous, but it had brought us closer together. We were finally on the path to a stronger, more united family.